This podcast series is supported by members at Patreon. If you want to support this podcast series, head to patreon.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. Changes to the establishment don't happen on their own. It takes a revolution. Welcome to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. My name's Aaron, and I'm a Cascadian. I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. I'm a music producer and have a passion for beer. I don't consider myself an expert in beer by any means, but I do enjoy and respect the craft and the passion of these brewmasters. I want to learn from these pioneers on what sets them apart from the rest and why they choose to call Cascadia their home. Cascadia is a bioregion in the Pacific Northwest on the North American continent. It is made up of the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon, as well as the Canadian province of British Columbia. In this podcast series, I'll be profiling the unique breweries of Cascadia, a region that has a strong presence on the international beer scene. During Bellingham Beer Week, I attended a talk by prominent beer writer Joe Weeb, better known as the Thirsty Writer. The talk was about the history of craft beer in B.C. and key moments that ignited the revolution. If after listening to this you want to know more, you can check out Joe's book, Craft Beer Revolution. Links are in the show notes. So to get things started, here's Mari, the co-owner of Chuck and Nut Brewery, to introduce the talk. We're very fortunate tonight to start our lecture series here at Chuck and Nut with a great guy named Joe Weeb. He's the thirsty writer. He's been writing about beer since, what, 2008 or something? And he knows everything about our Canadian beer friends across the border in B.C., British Columbia. And he's here tonight to tell us what the latest is. It's been an explosion. So I'm sure Joe has a lot of new information for us that we have not heard yet. We are really pleased that he decided to come and talk to you guys tonight. So please give him a warm Bellingham welcome, <laughs> Joey. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and the invitation to be here in the first place. It was really exciting when Mary asked me to come out to be part of this uh, series and to talk to you guys. Um, I've been wanting to return to Bellingham. You know, I came out, like she said, uh, September 2013, just to check out the beer scene here. And back then there were, you know, three breweries. Kulshin had just opened. So it was it was really small. It was really interesting, though. We went on a bunch of hikes and did stuff like that to kind of fill the time. Today, I went to five breweries. <laughs> Yesterday, I was at three, and I got two more to go to tomorrow. So it's, uh, it's a totally different vibe now. You know, there's no time for hiking anymore. I'll have to add some days onto the onto the visit. But we had a I've had a really good time uh, kind of reacquainting myself, I guess, with the scene here. I live in Victoria, which is the capital city, uh, which is just at the bottom of Vancouver Island, which is just across the water from here, basically. We have very similar, everything seems really similar to me. Like the weather is always the same. The vibe is very much the same. Victoria is a little bit bigger than Bellingham, but not a ton bigger. But I also lived in Vancouver for a while. So a little background on me. I started, uh, I grew up in Ontario near, near Niagara Falls, Niagara on the Lake, which is a wine growing area. And then, uh, but it's also very conservative and very religious. And I wanted to get the hell out of there as soon as I could. So in 91, after I had been on a backpacking trip around Europe, I uh, decided I was just going to move out to BC. A couple of my brothers were living in Victoria at the time. And I just thought on a whim, I'll just go and see what it's like and fell in love with uh, the whole scene. Never left, although I shouldn't say that because I also lived in Winnipeg for a year and a half, but I don't really think count that because uh, I came back. <laughs> But I lived in Victoria for the 90s, and then I lived in Vancouver, basically, from 2001 to 2012. Uh, so Vancouver, of course, I'm talking about Vancouver, BC, not Vancouver, Washington. It seems like you guys understand that, but down in Oregon, if I'm at, in Portland, I was talking to Ezra about that, it's a little less clear, although he told me that they call Vancouver, Washington, Vantucky. Yeah. <laughs> so now I've learned a thing about it. That's good. So um, Vancouver, of course, is our biggest city in, in BC, comparable to a little smaller than Seattle, I think, but a similar kind of feel. 
in a lot of ways. And I lived in both places. I moved back to Victoria in 2012. Uh, I, my wife and I had a, a boy, a son in, in 2008, and it just felt like the, the better vibe for us. Vancouver is, has, been, has gone through this amazing boom in real estate, right? And the housing costs have skyrocketed. So we were finding ourselves being moved into worst and worst and worst places that we could afford. So uh, Victoria is a little more civilized that way, although it's starting to happen there too. But anyway, enough talk about housing and all that stuff. That's not important. So in terms of beer, when I arrived in Victoria in 91, I moved into this little house at the end of a, a newly built walkway that had just been built along the inner harbor there. As I walked into town on the first day, checking out the scene with my brother, we walked right past this beautiful place. And my brother said, look, that's a brew pub called Spinnaker's. What's a brew pub? I'd never heard of that before. So, you know, uh, we checked it out. And of course, Spinnaker's brew pub was the first brew pub in Canada. It was built in 1984. Uh, it was founded by a man named John Mitchell uh, with the help of an architect named Paul Hadfield, who eventually took over the place and has been running it ever since. He's not an architect, hasn't been an architect for a long time now, but he's been the, the manager, the publican of it for more than 30 years now. Spinnaker's uh, is kind of the, uh, I call it the cradle of the revolution. Uh, my book, which I should have mentioned already, <laughs> is called Craft Beer Revolution, and it's uh, the insider's guide to BC breweries. So I use a lot of the revolution theme in, in uh, my, my talking and writing about beer in BC. So I like to call Spinnaker's the cradle of the revolution because to me it's where things really got going and got kind of vaulted and, and started off. Uh, but there was already another brew pub there called Swans, which is another great spot. And so when I arrived in Victoria, there was already a couple of brew, uh, brew pubs. There was a, uh, a couple of breweries, production breweries that had opened. So Victoria was very much the, uh, the heart and soul of the craft beer movement in BC at the time already. As you know, a lot of things have happened over the years since then. If you look at BC geographically, you know, Victoria, as I said, is the capital, but Vancouver is the biggest city. So Vancouver has always played a really important role in terms of the development of, of craft beer in BC as well. The same year that Spinnaker's opened in 1984, a brewery in Vancouver called Granville Island Brewing opened as well. And that was a, a little brewery on um, this uh, industrial area that had been converted, recently converted, called Granville Island, right in the heart of Vancouver, right in the, in the inner harbor area there, in the, sorry, the False Creek, it's called, right directly in the middle of the city. And it had all been industrial lands, but they converted it all in the in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And they opened this brewery there. And it was a hugely important thing to have this brewery there because it, it kind of introduced Vancouver to craft beer. Although back then, of course, we didn't really call it craft beer yet. We were calling it microbrew because there wasn't really a uh, proper word for it. The government liked to call it microbrewing for the taxation purposes. But, you know, so we didn't really know what else to call it. But microbrewing was the term we used probably until about 10 or 15 years ago when it started to become called craft beer. And I remember in the early days, in the early 90s, when I first arrived there, I'd go into a bar or a pub and I'd timidly go up to the bartender and, or the server and say, do you guys have any micro brew? And depending, you know, you'd, you'd hope that, they, that, the, that their face wouldn't go like, what? What are you talking about? And, uh, you know, hopefully you're in the right place and, and they had a, a one or two different uh, micro brews on top. So you got to know pretty quickly which were the good places to go. But so let's say around the 90s when I first arrived, I think I would say there was about a dozen microbreweries in BC at that point. So things uh, were starting to happen. It was pretty early days still. Oh, actually, you know, I just remembered a funny story about Spinnaker's, which I should, should mention. So Spinnaker's, I told you, opened in 1984, the first microbrewery in Canada. Paul Hadfield, the fellow who uh, I mentioned has been running it since the early days, he tells a story about how back in, I think, 85 or so, there was the first craft brewers conference in um, Portland at that time. And it was a very small affair. Apparently, there was only a dozen or 20 breweries represented there or something like that. And apparently, he tells a story that apparently the, the people at the conference rented a bus to drive up to Victoria to see Spinnaker's because at that point, there weren't any brew pubs in Portland yet. So nobody really knew what a, what a brew pub was. So that's kind of interesting to, to make that comparison and to think about that in terms of the way history has gone. I think Ezra told me there is about 70-something breweries in Portland now alone. So things have, have developed quickly. So, okay, so going back to the early 90s, I said we had about a dozen breweries in BC at that point, mostly in Victoria and the Vancouver area, but a few, a few spread farther afield. There was a brewery out in Nelson already pretty early, which is Nelson is almost all the way to the uh, Alberta border, if you know your geography at all. Whistler had a brewery open by then. 
Um, so things are starting to happen and starting to spread. Vancouver actually had a bit of a, a mini brewery boom in the 90s. It was when a whole bunch of breweries and brew pubs opened there, and things really seemed to be taking off. But then it seemed to peak at about 1998, and actually from 1998 until 2012, no new breweries opened in the city of Vancouver that whole time. It was pretty pretty strange to, to think about it. But I guess the cost of uh, real estate and all the rest of it was affecting things at that point. But breweries continued to open throughout BC and to expand. Victoria kind of remained the, the center of the movement for most of the time there. We, we had a, a bunch of new breweries open. There was a brewery that opened there in 2001 in Victoria uh, by a man named Matt Phillips, who started off as a one-man show. Uh, he did everything, you know, from brewing the beer to washing the kegs and, and uh, delivering the beer and selling the beer and all the rest of it. He lived in his brewery. To start the brewery, though, he had gone to the banks and asked for, uh, asked for support, and the banks had all turned him down. So he just took out, basically what he did is he signed out all the credit card applications he could find and uh, maxed out all those credit cards to start his brewery. For, for the first year or so, as I said, he was a one-man show. He lived in his brewery, he showered in a nearby gym. And then slowly but surely, he managed to expand his operation and to the point where now Phillips Brewing, which is uh, in Victoria, as I mentioned, is, is the largest brewery, the largest microbrewery in BC. Uh, he added a malting facility a few years ago. So it's now Phillips Brewing and Malt Works. He actually works with farmers up and down Vancouver Island and from, uh, there's another grain growing region up kind of near the Alberta border and it's called the Peace Country where a lot of uh, grain is grown. And so he uses all, all BC barley and wheat in, in the malt works there and uses it in his own beers. And it's a pretty cool, pretty cool setup. But that's, you know, a great story of success story from starting one man journey like that. So in the mid 2000s, we probably had about 35 breweries in BC at that point, spread across microbreweries, spread across the, the whole scene. And things were kind of progressing. I have this cool graph I like to show when I do presentations that kind of, you know, it's just gradually, 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 like very steady, nothing really, you know, no crazy bursts or dips or anything like that. But as I said before, we didn't have any new breweries opening in Vancouver for this long stretch of time, but there was a lot of really interesting things happening in the background that I think were really important to consider. We have a government liquor store system, first of all, in British Columbia. So we have uh, up until the late 90s, the only place you could go to buy booze was in the government liquor stores. But then they introduced what they called cold beer and wine stores, which were private stores that people were allowed to open. And they issued, eventually they capped it at, I think, about 850 licenses across the province. But these were initially just stores that sold the same products that were available. And, and at first, it was just cold beer and wine. It wasn't any, any uh, spirits at all. But the same products that were available in the government stores, and the idea was they would charge a little bit more because they'd be open late. Uh, they'd be open on, on days like Sundays when the government stores weren't open. And they would serve the beer cold. What a concept. They would keep it cold and sell it that way. So uh, at first, they, were, they, they weren't important in terms of the craft beer scene because they, they didn't really offer anything important. But later, starting in the mid-2000s, I guess, they started specializing a lot more. So a lot of these stores started to become more and more like the bottle shops, like Elizabeth Station and so on here, uh, where they would bring in special beers from down here. A lot of beers came from south of the border, and they would bring in beers from Europe, from Belgium and Germany and so on. And this, this really played an important part because not only did it introduce these beers to consumers who hadn't had them before, um, who were just used to the, the kind of the main beers that were being produced in Canada and in BC especially, so consumers kind of started discovering all these new beers, but the brewers also started tasting these beers that were being brewed in, in Oregon and in, here in Washington, of course. And, and so they were, you know, they were challenged by that. You know, I remember talking to uh, Gary Lowen, who's the brewmaster at Central City Brewers in uh, Surrey, BC, which is right near Vancouver. He's a really prominent name in the, in the business up there. And, and he, you know, he told me once, like that was, he took it as a challenge. You know, he started drinking these IPAs from Portland and he was like, wow, this is, I gotta, I gotta make beer, you know, as good or better than this. So that was something that was really important, I think, in the industry. There, we, it was kind of like we had been, you know, this insular little bubble. We weren't really seeing what was, what else was out there before then. So that was part of it. Another important thing that happened in the background at, at that point was the arrival of kind of the tap house culture. So we had, you know, lots of bars and pubs and things like that, that that would have, you know, eight or 10 or 12 taps, but they would basically be the same beers always. They would maybe change one tap once in a while, maybe seasonally or something like that. But this uh, place in Vancouver opened called the Alibi Room in Gastown, which is the old historic 
the original kind of neighborhood that where Vancouver started. It was started by a guy named Nigel Springthorpe who who took over the operating the place and he just really liked beer and he wanted to learn more about it. He didn't know much about it yet. So he started adding more taps and going out and looking for beers and he would just bring in stuff and, you know, one keg and rotate and there'd be new stuff on all the time. So eventually he grew the list of 50 taps. And uh, by the time, you know, I remember going there in 2007 or 2008 and it was just like heaven. It was headquarters for craft beer in, in, in Vancouver and you just anybody who was into beer would would be at the alibi room, right? That was the place to go. And he would, you know, like I said, he would go off and on a Saturday and drive off to a brewery he'd heard of and knock on their door and say, "Can I get a keg of your beer?" And they'd be like, "Sure, where where are you from?" You know. And but it kind of changed from that to the point where people were seeking, you know, where where the breweries were vying to get their beer on top at the alibi room because it became the standard of excellence, right? If you got your beer on top, if Nigel put your beer on top, then you knew you'd made it, right? So he kind of became the, the standard setter in a lot of ways. And then interestingly enough, he worked uh, with a, a brewer to open a brewery in, in Vancouver a couple of years ago called Brass Neck. Brass Neck is widely considered to be, if not the best, you know, one of the best for sure breweries in uh, in Vancouver for sure now. So he, he doesn't brew the beer, but uh, he works with a really top-notch brewer to do that. So these these were all the things that were happening in the background while, uh, while things were kind of just steadily growing. And then 2008 is also kind of a moment for me in my personal life when I decided to become a beer writer in a lot of ways. I'd been writing about beer. I'd been, I'd been doing travel writing and freelance writing, but I hadn't really thought, can I just write about beer? But I was actually on a trip to California wine country with a, a bunch of wine writers. I was just a travel writer writing a story for the Vancouver Sun newspaper. And we spent three days walking through vineyards in Sonoma and tasting all these amazing wines and having these amazing dinners. And on the second night, the uh, the wine writers all kind of staged an intervention with me. And they said, you know, all you do is talk about beer all the time. And they said, you should become a beer beer writer, not a wine writer. And, you know, I it was kind of a joke, but I took their advice to heart. And, you know, I, I had been thinking about it already, like trying to formulate, is this something that I could make make sense of? I could I actually do this? And so I, when I came home, I, I adopted the thirsty writer name and social media and all that stuff. And uh, I started really pursuing that as a as what I wanted to do, as what I wanted to write about. And, you know, I still occasionally write about other things, but most of the time I'm just writing about beer, which is really cool. If I think back to that guy who moved, that that 21-year-old who moved to Victoria in 91 and and, and, and told him that, you know, he was going to become a guy who wrote books about beer and talked about beer and stuff, places like this, he'd be pretty happy about that, I'm sure. So, so my book kind of uh, evolved out of that. It took a little while to come to fruition, but uh, the first edition came out in 2013, and at that point, there were 50 breweries in BC. So things had been progressing since uh, I mentioned, I think 2008 was where I left off. You know, at, uh, 50 breweries is a pretty big number. What seemed like a pretty big number at the time. And it was certainly uh, a lot to talk about. People were very excited to to be able to uh, pick up a book that had so many different stories in it. My book is not just about the breweries. It's about the whole history of the uh, of the scene in British Columbia going back to the early days and uh, talking about some of the mo- um, important people that played a part and so on. So it's it's bigger than just profiles of the breweries. But uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And that first year, I did a uh, a tour around visiting a bunch of breweries and you know holding talks and book signings and so on. And it was really exciting to see the the the, the amount of interest there was for craft beer out there. But I did not know what was about to happen, uh, which was so that first edition had fifty breweries in it in 2013. This second edition, which came out in 2015 has 90 breweries in it. And at latest count, I've got 131 breweries on my list of breweries spreadsheet at home. So uh, it's just gone nuts. So since 2012 to 2013, then what is that? That's uh, 80, 80 breweries have opened in in, uh, in just in five years. It's been crazy. Uh, so we're, we're new breweries are opening now at the pace of about 20 a year in BC. And the big thing that happened that kind of spurred this when I look at it is a combination of kind of those other factors I mentioned, like the bottle shops evolution and the uh, tap house evolution, which is something now there's lots and lots of places and uh, communities all around BC that have big tap lists. There's a place in Vancouver that has 150 taps, uh, but it's a bit of a it's a bit of a corporate kind of place. So the beers aren't all that good, uh, but there are some good, obviously. A list of 150, you can't go wrong. There's got to be a few good ones on there. But I think they said they have three miles of, of tubes, you know, between the fridges and the and the bar, right? So that's kind of crazy. 
So the, the other big thing that happened that really changed things in BC happened in 2013. And it was actually quite innocuous when it was first announced. But what happened was the government announced a change which allowed breweries, production breweries, to open their own tasting lounges. And that may seem like, what's the big deal? Because you guys all have that here. But prior to that, we basically had brew pubs. There were two types of things. There were brew pubs and breweries. Brew pubs obviously would have a restaurant connected to them. And they would brew the beer like spinnakers. Like I mentioned, they would brew the beer and and serve it with food. But then there were breweries and they weren't allowed to sell their beer by the glass. They were allowed to give samples, like little tiny, you know, four ounce samples, but they weren't allowed to do more than 12 ounces per person per day. So basically they would have like, if they had a front room, they would just give away little samples at most. They wouldn't even bother selling them because it was such a small amount. And so we didn't really have this kind of culture that you guys have here with breweries that have their tasting rooms, you know, like I visited several today where like structures or uh, gruff, you know, where they just have these awesome, you know, you're in the brewery and you're drinking beer and it's, it's, uh, it's the best way to do it. But that was announced, the government in BC announced that in early in 2013, that breweries could start, breweries and distilleries actually could start doing that. Wineries already had been allowed to for a while, but in BC, wine is king and wine gets to do whatever they want. So, because they spend a lot of money on the government, basically, they're good at that. Uh, anyway, so when this happened, there had been a small kind of number of breweries, a couple of new breweries had opened in Vancouver already at that point, and there were a few in the works, but they suddenly realized that this was a new model that they could adopt that uh, they'd seen in places like, you know, Washington and Oregon, but which we hadn't seen in, in BC before. And as a result, uh, it just led to this incredible boom of new breweries because suddenly breweries could open pretty small because they could sell beer by the glass at the retail price point rather than sell, having to be forced to sell it by the keg wholesale, you know, and that requires a much bigger facility to sell a lot more beer, basically, to make it viable financially. And so suddenly we had, instead of, you know, just the occasional big brewery, or not big, but not big by your standards, maybe, but big by BC standards, the occasional big brewery opening here and there, you'd, you'd have a, like a whole bunch of little breweries opening in one area, you know, in Vancouver now, uh, just in the last four or five years, there's basically like three distinct brewery neighborhoods that have formed since that didn't exist, you know, five years ago. Um, there's one in an area called Mount Pleasant, it's also known as Brewery Creek, actually, ironically, because it was a place where the first breweries opened in Vancouver back in the 1890s. And they have, uh, there's that's where Brassnick is, the one I mentioned. And there's another brewery called 33 Acres there that's really good. Main Street Brewing and a couple more all kind of along the, the one street there in the same neighborhood. There's another pocket over in East Vancouver, or as they like to call it now, Yeast Van, where there's a good eight or nine breweries all kind of spread around in the same area, you know, pretty much walkable between them. And and a lot of them are not even selling their beer, not even packaging their beer. They're just selling it in the in the brewery itself. So you can you can go in and order beer by the glass. You can do little sample flights and you can do um, fill a growler, that kind of thing. But they don't even, like Brassneck doesn't even package their beer in bottles. The only... Only time they've ever packaged a beer in bottles is when they've done a collaboration brew with another another brewery, and that's that's it. And even then, they, they don't even ship their beer outside of Vancouver. I, I'm lucky because there's a great tap house in Victoria called The Drake, which um, has developed a relationship with Brassneck, so they go over and, and get some kegs once in a while from Brassneck to serve in Victoria, and I get to taste it there without having to go to Vancouver. So this has been amazing, and that's like of all those 80 or so new breweries that have opened since 2012, I would bet you that a good 60 of them are those little breweries with the ta- with the tasting lounge front and center. And that's the whole model that's driven this boom. And it's happening in cities like Vancouver. It's happening in small communities. There's a, there's a little area um, sort of midway up Vancouver Island, a, a city named called Courtney, uh, and also Cumberland, which is a little mo- old coal mining town near it. And they've got three breweries just in that little Courtney Cumberland area. Um, all just focused on the little tasting room and really, really good vibe, really good beer. Uh, and it's it's ideal for, you know, beer tourism, right? Which is something that's growing and becoming more and more popular and something I'm going to uh, talk about in a moment as well. So this, uh, this the scene in BC is going strong. Um, we have an amazing assortment of breweries spread all across the map now. Vancouver is definitely the the leader now, no question. Um, Victoria is still going strong, but hasn't really, hasn't really kind of advanced in the same way that Vancouver has in recent years. So 
Right now, I think there's about 20, 25, 26 breweries in Vancouver itself. And there's another 25 or 26 in the immediate kind of suburbs, suburbs around Vancouver. Lots of really, really interesting breweries there. There's a brewery called Daggerad in Burnaby, which is a suburb of Vancouver. And it's a Belgian style brewery. They only make Belgian style beers. The founder is a guy who had met some Belgian guys on a, on a backpacking trip in Southeast Asia, like way back in the nineties or something and, and became friends. And so he would go over and visit his friends in Antwerp. And he said they would sit, you know, they'd go out to the Daggerad Platz, which is uh, Daggerad means daybreak or sun, sunrise. And they'd sit there, three corners of the square are all tables, like cafe tables from bars. And they would sit there and, and catch up and drink these amazing Belgian beers. And he just said it was so good. And he said uh, every time he came back, he would think, you know, he wanted to go back to visit his friends, but more and more he wanted to go back and drink the beer, right? So he was a home brewer and he started playing around and he thought, oh, I wonder if I can recreate one of those beers. And so he came up with a recipe for a, a Belgian blonde ale and he was sure he was going to screw it up, but he said, actually, it was perfect. It was just like what he'd remembered tasting there. And he thought, okay, I got I to gotta see if I can make this a reality and, and uh, make my own brewery. So he, he did. And that opened in 2014. And it's an amazing spot because it's actually, it's like located in a real, you know, one of those big, huge uh, kind of industrial areas with just all those, you know, uh, warehouses and, and you have to kind of snake your way through a bunch of roads to find it. It's just not conducive at all to someone just stumbling across it. But people go there, you know, he's got a tasting room and it's always full. The beer is excellent and it's all Belgian style stuff. He doesn't brew an IPA, you know, uh, he... He was reluctant to put anything on tap because he wanted to bottle condition everything. But finally, he gave in and started keg conditioning some beers so that he could actually put them on tap too. And, but I like that story because to me, it shows the maturity of the BC beer community that a brewery can open that is so specific in its styles, right? We're starting to see things like, I mean, we've had sour beers happening for a while, but we're starting to see breweries specialize in, in different you know, barrel aging and real interesting specialties as well. So things are really progressing and moving forward. So I mentioned beer tourism. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is the, uh, the BC Ale Trail project, which is important to me and I'm part of. So a couple of years ago, the overall tourism body for BC, which is called Destination BC, announced a project where they would match funds, basically, if you could put, put together funding for a marketing project to promote British Columbia in some unique way, they would match the funds from their resources. And basically, I remember we heard about this and I started talking to some colleagues with the BC Craft Brewers Guild uh, and trying to figure out how we could make this, how we could access this money. And we, we managed to do it. And so basically, the, what we created is the BC Ale Trail, which is uh, primarily a website. So check it out next time you get a chance, bcaletrail.com. And the idea is that we're, we're working with specific regions. We launched last October with seven different regions. So we don't cover all of BC yet, but we're hoping to eventually expand and cover it all. But each region gets a really, really detailed um, itinerary, sample itinerary to promote visiting the breweries in that region and other activities that go along with beer. You know, like uh, you can go to the Sunshine Coast and uh, and go hiking and mountain biking and, and do lots of cool things there and visit the breweries that are there as well. We write the sample itinerary. I write profiles of all the breweries and, and the regions, and we send a video and photographer team to to shoot their shots and they've done some done some amazing videos that are just beautiful to promote the uh, the craft beer communities in BC. So as I said, we launched with seven regions in October. We're working to add another, I think, eight this year. So that's kind of what I'll be working on over the next few months, doing all the writing and a lot of planning for that. Uh, and we're starting to expand in terms of offering more things. You know, you guys have the Bellingham Tap Trail here with the passport and the stamps and all that, which is really cool. I like that. And we don't have that with the BCL trail yet, but, you know, maybe it's something we'll be able to add. But the idea, you know, is to get people to, uh, to plan a trip, you know, to, to look, at the, look at the map and say, well, let's see, if we went to this region, what would it be like? So you guys, you are lucky because you're so close. <laughs> Obviously, Vancouver is the easiest destination for you to visit uh, if you were to go there. We don't have Vancouver on the Ale Trail quite yet. We'll be adding that this summer. So look, look for that. But you can't really go wrong. There's tons of great opportunities in Vancouver to check out the beer scene. You could go for a couple of days. You could go for a week and you wouldn't be disappointed. There's lots of opportunities for doing other activities uh, nearby Vancouver. You know, you can go up to Whistler. Uh, there's three breweries now in Squamish, which is this halfway point to Whistler that has amazing outdoor activities. There's a rock climbing massif called uh, 
the the chief that's just amazing and uh there's lots of great things there obviously to check out you know even even from here you, it's not too far to go to places like the Okanagan which is the uh, wine growing region but we also have tons of great breweries there in Kelowna and Penticton uh Kelowna is going through a little mini brewery boom right now which is really really exciting as well and obviously Victoria I have to my heart and soul so uh you can take the ferry across from Anacortes just down am I pointing the right way is that that way <laughs> that way and uh that's a really nice ferry ride uh we do victoria beer week so that's the other thing i'm involved with i'm a co-founder and producer of victoria beer week and that happens every march this year was nine days march 3 to 11 with 16 different events and we do it a little differently than the model here and the difference is that we kind of produce all the events ourselves so we're staging events in venues not in the breweries specifically but in in venues there's a really nice venue in victoria called the victoria public market that we use in the evenings after the market stalls are closed basically which holds about 450 people so we do a lot of events in there with uh, beer and cheese and sour beers and cask nights with 25 different casks from breweries all over bc and lots of different things uh, spread out over nine days so that's a really good opportunity if you want to plan a trip to victoria sometime maybe think about doing it in march next year yeah, so I think uh, I'm coming to a close here. If you do um, get up to uh, BC, shortly after you cross the border, there's uh, an amazing brewery in Delta, which is right before the uh, the tunnel. If you have driven up to Vancouver and you've gone through the tunnel, instead of going through the tunnel, hang a right, right before the tunnel, and go a short distance to Four Winds Brewing. Four Winds was named Canadian Brewery of the Year a couple of years ago, and won Beer of the Year at the Canadian Brewing Awards just last year for its amazing sour beer called Nectaris. And they're super good. And they, they opened, actually, what's funny is they opened right when my book came out. They were the, the first book in 2013. They were the first brewery to open. I remember joking at my book launch in Vancouver at the end of my talk. I said, well, and I just got to say my book's already out of date because I pointed at the brewmaster. I said, Brent Mills just opened Four Winds in Delta last week. So, But they, you know, they've done amazing things and they really have, uh, have a, a, an amazing beer scene there. But so I'd say, you know, stop at Four Winds and check it out. So yeah, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much to Joe Weeb for letting me record his talk and also checking that brewery for putting on the event. If you want to learn more and check out the book, you can go to craftbeerrevolution.ca. Links are also in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, why not leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts? If you want to follow this podcast series, you can do so by going to facebook.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. We're also uh, on Twitter at Cascadian Beer. If you want to support this podcast series, you can do so by going to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, remember, support your local.